So the next session is on e-discovery in the cloud, which will be presented by Stephen Stewart, who is the Chief Technology Officer for Nuix. Stephen joined Nuix in 2008 and is responsible for leading the evolution of Nuix's software. He's currently driving the development of Nuix's information governance and big data solutions. Stephen has more than 15 years' experience working with both public and private sector organisations, designing and providing solutions for that their email, file document management and archiving system. So please welcome Stephen. Thank you, Alison. That makes it sound so glamorous, uh, as well as well-versed and skilled. Uh, so one of the things, you know, over the years, it's sort of become very common that, you know, organizations are moving their data to the cloud. Everyone is evolving. You know, out of this audience, just a quick survey, and I was trying to figure it out while I was getting warmed up, would you, how many would you qualify yourselves as techies versus attorneys? Okay, about 50-50. And it almost break down, breaks down by who's wearing a tie and who's not. So that was about what I was trying to guess. I like to spice it up uh, and wear a tie and confuse people. Uh, one of the things that as sort of messaging around the cloud is evolving, uh, out of the show of hands again, how many of you would consider yourselves well versed in what the cloud offers? Okay. How about the risks of the cloud? Okay. How many would you how many of you would say that you have data in the cloud? Okay. Excellent. Because it most probably every single one of you that has a smartphone is in some way, shape, or form have some type of data in the cloud, whether or not you've got your iPhone and you're using iCloud or you're using Gmail or something of that nature. You almost invariably have some kind of data up there. Now, how many of you have responded? I'm sorry, I keep tapping on this and I'll make a nice echo. Uh, how many of you have performed some sort of e-discovery or litigation event where data lived in the cloud? Okay, so again, so this is a well-seasoned and well-versed crowd. So one of the first things I want to talk to you uh, is about data in the cloud. You know, what does this actually mean? Uh, what are the challenges? And again, you know, despite the introduction, I'm really sort of my role at Nuex is where the rubber meets the road. You know, talk about sort of the highfalutin ideas, the thought leadership, but then basically it's got to turn into something that can be actioned. How do I actually get at that data? How do I go up there? How do I get it? How do I bring it down? How do I perform discovery against it? How do I march it through the process? How do I access it, secure it, chain of custody, the whole kit and caboodle? And I've for years been fascinated by what the cloud brings to that. You know, for many years, people sort of thought of cloud, ah, it's, how is that different than hosting? How can we really take advantage of this infrastructure? And really, how can I drive and make my processing, my entire business process more efficient by leveraging the cloud? And then also just want to touch a little bit on sort of enabling cloud-based discovery. So for the next 30 minutes, going to kind of run you through some of that. Uh, the biggest thing, and this is just sort of one stat from a single cloud storage provider. So this is Amazon's AWS S3 bucket. It was one of the first cloud-based object storage things up there. And they call it buckets for a reason. It's basically just a bucket of stuff, and you can write it out. So it ranges everything from small GIFs, HTML pages, email archives are backed by S3. You know, so as you're talking to many vendors that they offer a nice front-end solution, a lot of that data actually winds up in Amazon S3. So things like Box.net, Dropbox. Often if you really dig into the fine print and press them, they have a nice interface that sits on, on top of Amazon S3 because S3 is growing enormously. So they've got 1.3 trillion objects. They're basically, that's 142 objects per person on the planet. And it's growing at a rate of about 3.5 billion objects per day. And this is just a single cloud storage provider. That's just Amazon AWS. There's Azure. There's Google. There are hundreds of locals. And by the way, I didn't put these slides together. This is the local team that is, uh, has the, uh, the face roll. Uh, 
But the, the whole idea is that data is going up there incredibly fast. You know, people that are backing up their laptops, people that are doing any of that type of information, iCloud, your photos, your images. How many people have their personal photos up in the cloud? Exactly. You can't get away from it. So everyone might as well embrace it, you know, whether or not you're FaceTime, et cetera, et cetera. So as that data grows, you know, we're talking about an exabyte of data that's up there now, and that's only continued to grow. I was talking yesterday uh, to a federal law enforcement agency uh, down in Australia that is working on a global scale. So they're working with the U.S., they're working with the U.K., they're working with Canada. They're talking about that they now have an exabyte of data shared amongst them that they are trying to investigate and share intelligence across all of that. So again, the data that's up there is growing at an alarming rate. 67 million iPhones each most likely linked with iCloud. All of that personal information, it doesn't count people that are bringing their own devices to work, that are dealing with their iPads. Again, all of that content, all of that information is flowing up into the cloud. And this is the, really just the generic consumer stuff. You know, that doesn't even extend to organizations that are backing up their data through many of the various backup services straight to the cloud, putting it in things like Amazon's Glacier, which is sort of near line storage in the cloud, so tremendous volumes. And the reality is, is all of this stuff in theory is accessible. It's been put up there, you need to be able to get it back down, it's stored for convenience, it's stored for backup. And one of the consistent challenges across all of that information is it's not designed for accessibility. It's designed for storage. So there are applications that sit on top of it that are designed for accessibility. So how many people have an email archive? How many people have cussed at getting data out of their email archive? Okay, those are the truthful ones. Those, are, those were some shorthand waves. So I was with EMC for years. And so I was out, you know, I was in Australia for the first time in probably maybe 2000, 1999, 2000 as part of EMC's email extender team. We were selling email extender competes with Symantec, you know, this, that, and the other. And those original archives were built to consume information. Most of them were put out in response to either storage management requirements or they were put out in response to NASD broker dealer requirements. And really, they were driving data into them. When it came time to get that data back out, they didn't wow anyone with their search capabilities. And so now their entire businesses that have been built around getting that information back out. Same goes with email archiving in the cloud. You know, these things are designed to consume information and don't necessarily always deliver the search functionality. So again, how do we get access to that information? Your clients, your customers, your obligations don't differ whether the data is hosted on-prem or in the cloud, it's just the degree of difficulty which you face to try to get that information back out. So by the end of 2016, more than half of Global 500 companies will have moved data into the cloud. You know, one of NUX's business units, our intelligent migration business unit, is actually helping organizations move data to the cloud faster. So whether or not they're moving data to uh, an online archive, or they're actually migrating it directly to Office 365, there are thousands of organizations that are abandoning on-prem mail servers and moving out to places like Office 365. So again, quick show of hands, how many people are using Office 365 at work? Shane, what, who do you work for? <laughs> uh, uh, how about Gmail or Google Apps? Yeah, so many of you, and it's becoming much more common uh, in the United States, you know, that we have large organizations that are looking to basically outsource everything. They have been given the mandate that they are not expert at running their own internal infrastructure. So they are outsourcing critical services like email. They're outsourcing critical services like SharePoint. And they are moving in mass to things like Office 365, which is basically hosted Exchange, you know, hosted SharePoint, except it's running on a different type of infrastructure. It's basically just running on cloud infrastructure and really trying to manage all of that. So as that data transitions from on-prem to the cloud, so too go the challenges of trying to acquire it, protect it, preserve it. So I guess when I was thinking about the, this topic, you know, e-discovery in the cloud, you know, you can look at it from really two different perspectives. One is sort of the very techy perspective. You know, how do I get the best out of my cloud infrastructure as it relates to uh, processing, auto-scaling, utility compute models, and all this sort of really cool geeky stuff. Uh, but the other side is just how do I do the practical aspects of, I've got data that's in Office 365. 
How do I go out there and get it? I've got data in Google. How do I get that? File storage, box, Dropbox, pure storage, social. You know, what are the aspects of doing e-discovery against cloud content repositories, as well as what are the benefits of actually leveraging the cloud? So how many people in the room have used Amazon Web Services? Okay, a few. How about Azure? Kind of the, the flip side of that. Okay, for so those of you that have used AWS, and for those of you that haven't, how familiar are you with sort of the base premise of using something like an Amazon Web Services? Does that sort of, does that have any tangibility as to sort of what, of it, what does it mean to actually leverage AWS services or le leverage Azure services? Basically, it really dawned on me, it was maybe four years ago, it's really incredibly simple. You're basically starting a machine in someone else's data center, and you can hook it up to your American Express. It's pretty fantastic. Actually, you can get pretty expensive pretty quick. Uh, so another question, how many people have used Amazon? How many people have bought books on Amazon? Oh, great. So every single one of you can now go on to aws.amazon.com, and with your same login, you can start a Windows server with SQL on it. And it basically, it's just that simple. You can tie it to that same account, and it's now accessible. You can spin up dozens of machines or hundreds of machines. You can actually conduct business completely in that environment. And basically all of that occurs on what they call their utility compute model. So basically while those servers are running, you're getting billed by the hour. Now, we made a mistake and Eddie nearly had my head. Uh, if you don't turn them off, it's like the functional equivalent of leaving all the lights on in your house and going away for a month. The bill at the end of the month is really expensive. Uh, but it's really powerful. You can spin them up, you can use them, you can spin them down. We actually use them for training and all sorts of other use cases. But again, the idea of doing e-discovery in the cloud, as well as targeting cloud services uh, for e-discovery, are kind of two often muddled conversations. And one of the things that I like to try to do is, is a bit break them down into their, their different aspects. You know, so discovery against cloud content, this is, I don't want to say straightforward, but it's a known challenge. Office 365 offers APIs. Uh, Google, you can target it with IMAP. You know, there are various other tools that are out there, Nuex being one of them, that allow you to get at that content. You can consume it, you can pull it down. One of the biggest challenges, though, is data movement. Like, I've got data up there, I've got to get data down here to process it. I was talking to Angela Bunting uh, this morning, and I guess rightfully so, we're kind of spoiled in the US that we have this expectation of sort of near instant internet connectivity. We've got the guys from Equinix here that are sort of accelerating that. But when you get to the point of actually having to move data from the US to Australia or vice versa, that data's got to transmit across a very long, thin wire. And so just the sheer aspect of having to move that data back and forth is a huge impediment to basically speed or anything of that nature. So that in and of itself is a huge challenge. So wouldn't it be great if you could actually process the data in proximity to where it lives? If the data lives in the US or if the data lives in a US-based cloud, wouldn't it be great if I could go out there and process it there and drive it all remotely? You know, so for example, I could from this laptop log into my AWS account and I could start up servers in Sao Paulo, Australia, couple in the US, several throughout Tokyo, all in the span of about five minutes. You know, so it's an amazing sort of infrastructure that you can tap into. And all it does is basically help you overcome some of these challenges. From a technical perspective, you know, everything has to be done via the API. You know, so Nuex has claimed his fame as we skip, skip the API, we go directly against the data. When this stuff lives in the cloud, you're basically governed by the API. Microsoft Office 365 has got a really great trick in that they throttle. So no matter, no matter how fast you are, they'll only let you consume data at a certain rate. Because to them, any application that's slurping down huge amounts of information, well, that's not what a user does. You know, I mean, obviously all of us get lots of emails throughout the course of a day, but nobody is pulling down an entire mailbox and trying to do it in five minutes. So what they do is they shut you down or they throttle you or they force you through a pinhole because they don't want you to sort of bring their services down. Same goes if anyone has ever tried to do an IMAP collection from something like Google. You try to get a couple of IMAP collections going, and boom, Google will shut you down, or they'll transition their IP address. So they make it difficult for people to get that information. 
So there are tricks and how can I leverage like lots of instances within a cloud that all look like different people, that all sort of appear to be the individuals. These are all sort of tricks of the trade and how can I leverage like something like Amazon's infrastructure or Microsoft's Azure infrastructure to take advantage and basically work within their systems. You know, and then really, you know, as Ann has it, the tyranny of distance. Like copying all of that stuff across the wire over huge distances, it just takes time. It's not particularly efficient. And how can we basically overcome that? Legal. Now this is a tough one. You know, where's the data live? Is it guaranteed to be kept in the jurisdiction? You know, if Microsoft has a failover redundancy site, what does that look like? Does that mean that my data could potentially be outside of the jurisdiction? Like if you look at AWS and you look at uh, Azure, all of their data centers are in Ireland. You know, they're not in France for probably good reason. Uh, but basically that information is contained in those different data centers. They've also been smart with how they've built out their data centers and that basically they have their Azure infrastructure right next to their Office 365 infrastructure. So wouldn't it be great if I could put up a server in the cloud right next to, right next to Office 365 and basically consume that stuff locally? I also should probably stop and say, does anybody have any questions? This should be somewhat interactive instead of me just whitewashing you guys for 30 minutes. You may have your own hooks into that infrastructure, uh, but it becomes challenging. Like, how do I get it out? You know, when I said things about trying to get data out of uh, Google with IMAP, some of the guys who have tried it were nodding their heads. Because basically, you're just like anybody else. You come in through the front door, you're trying to create multiple connections, you're using IMAP uh, to basically pull that stuff down. It's pretty slow, does a pretty good job, but it's not one of these things that you can really tackle in great guns in a traditional fashion. However, you can start to think about using cloud infrastructure to make that stuff go better. And then really the last one is around cloud providers' discovery, discovery capabilities. Office 365 and Microsoft is going to tell you that you can do discovery against Office 365. They have search. They have all sorts of things. Uh, Amazon, no, excuse me, Google, they will push you to their online archive. I actually played with it. It's pretty neat. You can actually get your entire inbox and like 50 gigs of email stuffed in an inbox and then try to download it. It doesn't really work that well though, uh, but they've allowed you to do it one at a time. But again, that leaves you to your own devices to, in order to pull that information down and puts you in a situation where you then have to pull that information across the wire. So I've been at e uh, NuX for about five years. Uh, we've been using Gmail for about four. My G Google account has 55 gigs of data. So when I went into the process and said, let's archive that, it kicked out a bunch of inbox files and some other zip files. I couldn't actually pull it down. Like it literally, for me to pull it to my office in Philadelphia, uh, it failed every single time. Like the connection would time out. So basically, I said, all right, well, let's try that again. So let me spin up an instance in Amazon and try to copy it basically across the internet backbone. And it did it in 10 minutes. You know, so sort of the sheer nature of being able to tap into that sort of infrastructure provides tremendous acceleration. So think about if you guys were trying to do investigations or discovery against me. You know, I live in the U.S. We'll assume that my Gmail account is in the U.S. because that's basically where the proximity is. You could start that process and basically start the archival process. Odds of getting it copied down to Australia, I mean, I couldn't get it copied to Philadelphia. So slim to none to get it to pull all the way across the wire. But you could easily spin up an instance in Amazon or Azure, and I use them interchangeably. They're basically, you know, pick your flavor if you like Microsoft, if you like AWS, they pretty much offer the same services. Copy that data locally, and then process it right there on that instance. You know, do use your e-discovery tools, whichever they may be. I happen to be a big fan of new e discovery tools. Uh, but you could use whatever e-discovery tools that you can get to run up there to process that information. You can look at it. <clears throat> and it's all within the jurisdiction. You know, the data resides in the data center where it lives. You can basically keep it nice and local. You're also leveraging very much the fastest possible internet and internet backbone that's available. You know, in some instances, it's inside the same data center. You know, so there's the idea of, okay, great. <clears throat> I've got data in the cloud, how do I process it? One of the other sides of the coin is, you know, I've now committed to do processing in the cloud. What if I have data from behind the firewall and I want to leverage that same infrastructure. How do I get data up there? Uh, you can do the old school, you can copy it up there, you can FTP it, but then you basically face the same challenge. Uh, again, there are guys like Equinix that have, what is it, Express Connect, 
uh, as well as AWS has another offering around Direct Connect. And basically, you can leverage these data centers as basically pivot points into the internet. Or you can actually FedEx a hard drive in this case, to Amazon Web Services, sent it to a place in Herndon, Virginia, which is just sort of right outside DC. It's a big cement building that basically is an internet access point. And literally, they will take your hard drive and plug it into the side of the internet, and they will copy it into Amazon's S3 services. And so again, you can move hundreds, you can move terabytes of data at the speed at which Federal Express can get it over there. You know, they will also make special conditions that if you need to back a truck up full of a full rack of servers, they will plug it into the side of the internet and you can copy it up there. Now, you pay them for that. It's not actually that unreasonable, but you pay them for the privilege to be able to plug into the side of the internet. You pay for the time it takes to copy. You pay for the storage once it's out there. So this is not, it certainly isn't expensive, but it's definitely not free. Uh, but what you can do is you can start to work with huge amounts of information without this massive investment in your own infrastructure. I mean, that really is probably the single biggest advantage when organizations start to speak about leveraging cloud infrastructure, is you don't have to have that upfront investment. You know, if you need to spin up and do a ton of processing, you don't have to go out and contact Dell or Fujitsu or IBM and buy a bunch of servers. You just need a credit card that's got a pretty good limit on it. And just to give you a reference, to run a server uh, a nice server, you know, like 200 gigs of RAM, solid state disks, all sorts of fancy, virtualized, costs about five bucks an hour. That's the high end. You can get that all the way down to like 75 cents an hour for sort of a different server. And they even have a free tier if you want to sort of go out and play with it. So again, you've got a wide range of what you can do up there. Uh, and again, the whole idea is around extending your capabilities, uh, extending what you can do with this information, and trying to target the data locally. So one of the things that we've been working on to really try to overcome some of these problems is you know, this idea of, oh, it takes a long time to process information. How do we get that data up there? How do we sort of eliminate the tyranny of distance? Uh, and really, we've come up with the idea of geocolating your processing. Not geocolating, but geocolocating. Uh, and really, the idea is that someone like Azure has data centers around the globe. You know, so basically they've got one in the northwest of the U.S., they've got one in the northeast, uh, one in Europe. Those clouds are a little bit off, and I'm not sure. There's uh, Southeast Asia, Australia. I'm not sure where the middle one is. It's probably a different part of Europe. Uh, no, I guess Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Uh, but within those, if you're dealing with something like Office 365, they're actually running the place where you can start your server instances in the same data center as where Office 360 lives. So you can actually treat Office 365 as if it were an on-prem exchange server. And it's probably a better on-prem exchange server because the network is gonna be 10 gig and it's gonna be super fast and super awesome for that purpose. So these mailboxes are located in geo proximity to their users. So it doesn't make sense for Microsoft to host all of the Australians' mailboxes in Western Europe. Like, that's just a useless model because all it does is introduce latency to all of your transactions. So they want to put your mailbox, actually they said there's a pointer on here, they want to put your mailboxes as close as they can to you. So you'll have the best possible experience. So why wouldn't you adopt that same approach and put your processing in basically that same location? So now, for example, let's say I face an investigation and I've got, you know, out of my 50 users, I need to pull 10 users of their Office 365 mailboxes. And they're really spread around the globe. So the traditional model is, okay, I gotta go out and I'm gonna basically create a PST for every one of those users and I'm gonna pull it all back. Pardon me, I didn't change my diagram so that it all goes back to Australia. So it all pulls back to the East Coast. Uh, it was gonna take way too long to get the lines to be pretty and curvy. So we're just gonna go back to the East Coast of the US. Uh, so I copy it all back, which is fine, but it's gonna be slow uh, and not gonna be super efficient. So why wouldn't I try to basically process that data locally? You know, it, it maintains the jurisdiction. And the real the reality of this is that I can start up these instances in the same data center. So it's basically like going on site to do your processing. And you can do it with the same tools, make it efficient, and instead of sending all of that traffic across the wire, you're basically just searching across the wire. You're trying to make it nice and easy. And again, this is a little bit of the home team. 
you know, these are our icons. But this can be any tool that you use. Like, the reality is that people talk about the cloud. There are a bunch of Windows 2008 servers that are just running in VMware. You know, so how many people have VMware? Yeah, in essence, that's what AWS is. It's not VMware specifically, but it's that same idea. I can start up a server that has a specific profile. I can install whatever I want on it. It can be Windows, it can be this, that, or the other. And again, I can start it anywhere in the world. So with that, I then actually only have to pull back what I need. So I can do all of my searching, I can do my date filtering, I can do my culling, I can de do, do all my deduplication, I can do my entire workflow, and I can do it remotely, managed through RDP. You know, so very simple, very easy, and the vast majority of you and your techies are probably using RDP every single day to manage the servers in your own data center. So all this is is just a difference is that I'm managing a server in someone else's data center. You've got all the things around, I think they were talking this morning about security. You know, okay, security is a big deal. Everyone's got is up in arms about cloud security. I'm pretty sure that of the 20,000 people on the payroll at Amazon, they have a lot of guys that are tasked specifically with securing that data and securing that infrastructure nonstop. You know, they have layers of depth. You know, you can now encrypt all of your stuff as it goes into S3. You can encrypt your hard drive. Contact this stuff through HTTPS. They've got what are called virtual private clouds. And again, this is all the stuff that it's out there. You can build a highly secure infrastructure that is not in your own data center, but you access it the same way you would as a server down the hall. You RDP into it. So again, really powerful, really easy, really great way in which you can access that information. So one thing, and they actually removed these slides, and then I put them back in, because I think part of this is just a very practical aspect. So when you log in to Amazon, and this is one of the things, like I'm on this a bit of a crusade, that it, this is really, really simple stuff. And like this idea of somehow there's this mystery because it's happening in the cloud, that is completely incorrect. You can basically log in, have your credit card hooked up, and basically here, EC2, servers in the cloud. I want to start up an instance. So basically, I push the button that basically says EC2, and I want to launch instances. As you can see, we've got a few instances. We have virtual hard drives that are up there. So I can, if I want a 50 terabyte hard drive, Great, I just go to a drop down on the list and say I want to mount a 50 terabyte hard drive up against this server. Or I can just say launch, and basically I'm given a menu. Do I want a Linux server? Do I want a Windows server? Do I want a SQL server? Pretty much you name it. I go down, I pick, you know, select over here. Great, I can pick the flavor that I want. I then pick of how big of a server that I want. Do I want it to have, what, 108, no, what do I want? Have 32 cores? 60 gigs of RAM, and this is just the first slide. If I roll this down, you can take it up to 220 gigs of RAM, you know, SSDs. You know, talking about sort of eliminating the procurement process, you know, I need to phone someone up, I need to talk to Dell, I need to do this, et cetera. No, I want to start up a massive machine, and I want to use it very, very quickly and then spin it back down. And then once it's up and running, Boom, you know, you give it a name, you get your different instance types, it'll tell you where in the world it is, it'll give you a DNS name, it'll give you an IP address, and you can access it. Just as if someone down the hall had bought a server, set it up, and started to leverage it. And so the whole idea of this sort of notion of e-discovery in the cloud is this is a technology, and it's a basically a very rapidly evolving baseline technology that everyone should be considering using. You know, obviously we talk about the challenges and we talk about going out there and we talk about getting the data. You know, so a lot of people talk, spend their time at these conferences talking about e-discovery in the cloud and they talk about getting data from those resources. I think that it's missing a big chunk of the conversation, which I kind of harp on, is actually levering, leveraging the cloud itself to do faster and more efficient e-discovery. You know, you can go out there and you can get that information. You can leverage all of that infrastructure to go at it very quickly. And surprisingly enough, there are actually tools from vendors that make it easier. So Eddie's laughing. Uh, but the idea of spinning these instances up, you know, and I know that NUX is investing and investigating being able to launch an instance of all of our tools as part of Amazon. So literally go into where you saw that list this list. So this is Choose Your AMI. There also is called an AMI Marketplace. 
And you can basically spin up an SAP server or any other server that's out there that's in that marketplace. Start it up and start using it. And basically, it just the meter runs. So Nuex is very much looking into, uh, and it actually works, but it's about productizing and making it simple and all those things. You know, being able to run our e-discovery director up in the cloud. You know, it's just as easy as creating a case, go in, define what mailboxes you want to target. target. You know, so you need your credentials to target Office 365, and basically push the button. So this is really actually crystal clear on my laptop, but that is Doris Ryan at newxpa.info. That's basically someone's SMTP address. A common delimited list of SMTP addresses. This is just the URL. That's my connection string. That's my username and password. And I can push the button, and Nuex will go out and it'll basically consume those Office 365 mailboxes, and then you'll be able to run it through our sort of standard eDiscovery director workflow. So again, the idea of knocking down those barriers, running this on any cloud-based infrastructure, is all available. You can then drive that directly into. Yeah. Oh, see, that's actually one of the really cool things about sort of the, so I guess the question for everyone is, this data is up there in the cloud. How do I make sure it's gone? How do I destroy it at the end of the road? So the first and best way is to actually encrypt your hard drives. So basically, you can use standard sort of Microsoft encryption uh, so that no one other than you can actually open, you know, those encrypted drives. Uh, you then basically issue your delete request you know, within AWS, and all you're going to be storing is basically an encrypted blob. And so if you take your keys away, no one external in the data center can actually access that encrypted storage. But if I had somebody really smart that could break the encryption, um, that data is still sitting on the server, presumably. I mean, you, you've, issued the delete, you've issued the delete request, yeah. you know, so basically the pointers are gone. So someone's going to have to do sort of a forensic analysis against exabytes of blob storage uh, to try to get that back. So, I mean, it's as gone as it's probably going to be. It's probably more gone than if it's in your home data center uh, because they're going to constantly having stuff overwritten. You know, whereas your own data center, if you have a 50 terabyte volume, odds are you're not going to fill it up and overwrite it that fast. But if Amazon's, you know, S3 cloud is growing at 3.5 billion blobs a day, uh, they're more likely to fill those things up and roll them over faster. I mean, but it's, you know, the whole conversation around cybersecurity, smart people with, you know, motivated means uh, can do some great things. But you've got the defense in depth with Amazon or Azure and that their whole idea uh, of security is built on their reputation. So, I, I think guess it's the legal question around it that's the harder, the harder one. Ah, uh, I mean, from a technology perspective, I mean, you, you can't delete anything, truly. I mean, you can zero it out and basically overwrite it seven times to a DOD level. I mean, I don't know, if, and maybe we do it, you guys do it differently. I don't know of any U.S. litigation support service providers that when a case is deleted actually zero out everything, you know, seven times over. But with the cloud, you know, you've got the opportunity with encryption. And I think I'm getting the hook is what that looks like. Okay, so the hook looks a lot like this. So you can do all this great stuff and then you can access it and you can go through it. And you know, again, from a Nuex perspective, it's about making this easy. It's about making it accessible. It's about extending all of the traditional tools, but to be able to do it in a cloud-based environment. So it's as much about understanding the content types that you're targeting as learning to take advantage of the infrastructure that's available to you. And with that, I got the hook. So thank you. Wow, that was uh, very interesting, Stephen. Thank you very much for that. It, it opens up a whole new world um, to all of us, I think.